Today, 11 October, is National Coming Out Day. Part of me actually laughs at having one day for coming out. As I started to come to terms with my sexuality, having been in an opposite orientated marriage for nearly 20 years, I had found myself watching many coming out videos. They were predominantly young people and not people like myself in my 20s. There were videos of people coming out that seemed to go very well, even though they thought there might be some worst case scenarios that they'd planned in their head. There were unfortunately others where the worst case scenario did actually play out and the young person was kicked out of their home by their parents, often in response to their parents' understanding of some religious perspective predominantly from a Christian view, from what I saw. There were episodes of American TV shows such as What Would You Do? Taking actors into restaurants, playing out various scenarios such as a young man being forced to come out by his mates, a gay soldier, a young son coming out to their parents, sometimes with the added diversity of ethnicity. Various reactions of the person's treatment, often with pleasantly surprising results, even in some of the very conservative parts of America. But none of these seem to directly relate to me. Our stories are important. And I've been encouraged to write my story, and I'll talk about that on another day, but it's the importance of our collective stories that I believe has led me to feel that I should add my video to the collection of coming out stories. There'll be similarities, but there'll also be great differences. But collectively, our stories become a signpost that might guide others or maybe an anchor to be reminded of when the going gets really tough. So what are the high level perspectives of my story? So I'm Jason Masters and I grew up in Adelaide, the capital of South Australia. As an only child, I felt a number of pressures, being the child of a World War II veteran. He was on HMAS Australia, the flagship of the Australian fleet in World War II. And whilst there is some historic disagreement, many consider this ship to be the first ship ever hit by kamikazes. And then after a refit by the Americans, it was reattached to the American Fifth Fleet for the liberation of the Philippines, where they were hit in five kamikazes in three days. And in one of those attacks, he was injured. Not seriously, physically per se. But the mental scars and the resulting PTSD had a lifelong impact on him and our family. In his mind, I'm sure... He was only wanting the best for me. But for me, as an only child, I felt like I was never good enough, never reached that potential, that perfection that I should have. In one sense, in Australia, as in many uh, post-World War II countries, the impact of war was felt by families all the way across the globe. But for me, there was another dimension. My youth was pre-computers, the internet, mobile phones. And on my desk in my bedroom, there was a specially built area where the World Book Encyclopedia could fit. And this might sound odd, but in the playgrounds, there was often stirring up where you're a World Book or an Encyclopedia Britannica family. I know that probably sounds very weird to people now. But by the age of 10, I had some feelings and I had no idea of understanding what they were. By 13 or 14, I was discovered with a boy down the road, actually not doing very much. We hadn't even kissed and had no idea of what sex was. But the implications were quite severe. I was told I should never play with him again and certainly should never do anything like that again. 
Her family is, were great supporters of the Australian movie industry. And when my mum and her girlfriend went to see the ballet, Dad and I went to see the, the latest Australian movie by an emerging Australian director, Frank Schabelsky. The film was The Devil's Playground. Zane is a greatest digest. What are you going to do to me? Just a second, what do you think you're doing? How much is that dog? Wait the bit again, Alan. Alan! You're an idiot, Alan, what are you? An idiot, brother. Right, now that's enough. You know what wet dreams are? Yes, brother. <laughs> Sex. No, it's not natural. It must breed sick attitudes. What if God isn't there, huh? I very nearly lost my life because of you and your weakness. An experience I could well have done without. Oh, don't let's go through all that again. I hate life. I hate it! You see that? You're blowing mad! Get off him, bud! It's because we're one big happy family. <laughs> Auntie Mary's due to have a baby soon, might be twins. Death will come to each and every one of us. Forevermore, our ears will resound with the screams of the tormented. Scared? Scared of what? Scared of yourself. You don't sound sure. <laughs> I'm leaving tomorrow. We'd better stop. It was obvious that Dad was not aware of the content of this movie. But it was both educational and also incredibly nerve-wracking for me. There were bodies of boys all my age, all through the movie, naked torsos, and sometimes boys only in their speedos. The feelings I had in response to what I was seeing on the screen, I knew was no longer acceptable for me and couldn't be acknowledged. But it was educational in that it was through this movie that I gained my first insights into sex. As the film ended, I kind of wanted to sneak away somewhere way away from my father and was naturally horrified when my father said or asked if I did anything like that with any of the boys uh, at my school. Just further reinforcing that any interest in boys was unacceptable. Whilst I had thoughts of boys in the latter part of high school, I was petrified to take any action, just internally reinforcing my unacceptability in the eyes of my father and supposedly in all of society. There were times when I tried to contemplate experimenting, whatever that was, but it seemed every time I tried to put my toe in the water, something happened. Was it part of the voice of my father? even though I was now living in another city? Was it another voice of my involvement in my new church community, even though it was a relatively progressive one? When gay people were accepted as members of my church, I heard comments amongst some of the leaders that these people were probably pedophiles, that awful connection that many people make about gay people. And in my early 20s, when the HIV AIDS crisis was at its peak, and fortunately Australia had globally some of the most effective political and health responses. But part of that response was the Grim Reaper TV ad, which literally scared the shit out of me. First, only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. The fact is, over 50,000 men, women and children now carry the AIDS virus.
that in three years nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. That if not stopped, it could kill more Australians than World War II. But AIDS can be stopped and you can help stop it. If you have sex, have just one safe partner or always use condoms. Always. Moving again and after my father had died, I attempted to experiment once more, but it was a disaster. Mainly because I suspected I was doing it in spite of him rather than for me. In my new parish, there were discussions about the church allowing gay people to be ministers. And my minister was very clearly against this. So any thought that might have come up were quickly put back into the box and the box back into the closet. I had my first mental health crisis as I dealt with the death of my father and the traumatic implications on my life from our relationship. That process took well over three years of intense work, pain and rebuilding, and I successfully managed to navigate away from any discussion around my sexuality. So, like many gay men, I assumed that I really wasn't gay and that, like all good Christian men, um, I should get married. And I did so to an amazing woman who now suffers the pain of that falsehood that society and the church assisted in creating. During my 20 years of marriage, there are a number of highlights, particularly the birth of my two children and the journey that they take you on with all of its ups and downs. But there were two more episodes of mental health. The second was treated simply as overworked, but the third became far more challenging. Its trigger was actually unknown and my doctor was concerned enough to place me on some medication and referred me to a psychologist. She was at a Christian practice of psychologists, which made sense. My doctor was a Christian, I'm a Christian, so we had a framework to start with. But as time went on, I started to get an inkling of what the underlying issue might well be. I started to watch the YouTube videos and some of it resonated. Stories about sexuality, coming out, and gender. And then also sexual orientation. But I was also starting to hear videos of the dangers of Christian counsellors and how they might approach a gay Christian. I started to hear the horrors of gay conversion therapy. As my appointments went on, and as I was driving to my psychologist, I started asking myself, would I actually raise the unraisable? Some days I thought I would, but then in the sessions, I wouldn't. I really didn't know if there was the trust I needed with this psychologist to raise the unraisable. So I simply stopped seeing my psychologist. Probably not the most sensible thing, as my mental health went downhill again. But during this time, I finally came to the view that I was gay, and one day in my bedroom, I looked at myself in the mirror and spoke out the words, I am gay. And it resonated. And I said it again, and it resonated again. But then my wife became increasingly concerned about my mental health, and she wanted me to return to see the psychologist. But I mentioned that I'd stopped seeing her some six months ago, and that I didn't see any value in seeing her. So she insisted that I see our family doctor, and I agreed. But what was I going to say? So I booked a double appointment. I was nervous. My doctor was a Christian. How would he react? I de developed a list of topics to talk about, hoping that they would take most of the 30 minutes of the double appointment but that list was exhausted in five minutes. After a pause, he gently mentioned that I'd booked a double appointment and was there something else. I felt myself going to a tunnel, having to remember to breathe, stuttering, stopping, starting, and eventually said, I think I'm gay. 
Whilst I was in my mental tunnel, my doctor, realising that I wanted to say something significant, he had gently moved himself from behind his desk and was facing me. I was pleasantly surprised with his response. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You not accepting yourself can cause a lot of mental health issues. So I started a journey, a positive journey with my doctor as we found a new psychologist to help me through the next phase of my journey. When I met my new psychologist, I was starting from scratch and I had to say it again, I'm gay. And I was starting to understand that message of those earlier videos that I'd seen of those young people, some of whom had said, you don't come out once, you come out into a journey of forever coming out. As time went, I had many ups and downs. And they are for another video, but fair enough to say, I still had some very dark days for the next year or so after coming out. But there was this analogy my psychologist suggested that I've taken on into my journey, and I find it helps, that my life is like a stock market. It generally heads upwards, but there are some days that are worse than the day before. And occasionally there are stock market crashes, which can be terrifying. But as a, with the business, you build up resilience to deal with them. So part of my journey is to build up some resilience, to find those early warning signs of my stock market crashes, to be prepared and then develop techniques to work through those phases. One of the things I felt was that I had a moral obligation to tell everyone I was gay, which I suppose I'm kind of doing now. But back then, in those first few years, I felt that I'd been deceitful by not being my authentic self with people. So naturally, I had to tell everyone. But I was lucky there were two very wise and gentle people who grabbed me on different occasions and reminded me that I didn't have any obligation to tell anyone, apart from my family, and, and that's its own story. But people didn't hire me because I was married or didn't put me on various committees because I was married. So why did they now need to know this piece of information about my sexual orientation? So no, they encouraged me to think. In wanting to tell someone what was the purpose and the benefit in letting them know, and that became a very useful yardstick. But on this International Coming Out Day, for me it's been a very challenging journey, for which I am recording in my book, A Journey Towards Acceptance, which I expect to be released in early 2020. But what I know is that I am constantly making decisions. Do I need to come out to this person in this situation? Coming out is not a one-time event. And so maybe this is one of the reasons I wear this rainbow band on my watch. So people can make their own assumptions, right or wrong. Am I gay? Am I an ally? But if I do want to have a coming out conversation with that person, we might actually be partway there. But I do have to acknowledge that this only works in my context because... I'm relatively safe in the environment I live. But there are countries nearby Australia where such boldness would put your life at risk. And as I travel, I do have a different coloured watch band in my briefcase. No one should be forced out of the closet. I hope in the years ahead that there will be a society that understands that LGBTIQ people are just normal people part of the spectrum of human sexuality, human existence, so that young people don't feel any shame, can simply bring their significant person home and their parents and family won't bat an eyelid, whether it's a boy or a girl, it's just your special person. And finally, I hope that religion, in my case Christianity, that it will also see that Jesus summarised God's message in two very simple messages. Love God and love one another. Rather than what different 
denomination seem to strive to do to exclude LGBTQ people, that they will one day discover the wonders that God has provided to them through their LGBTQ members, that they should be fully welcomed, fully accepted, and that they then will understand the message that is given in the Corinthians passage about uh, one body but many paths, that we're all baptised in one Holy Spirit, that we are formed in one body. And the body is not made of just one part, but of many parts. And I hope that this might be part of a journey for you or your friends. If you like the series of videos that I'm developing, please subscribe. You know where the button is and you know where the like is. Um, I look forward to you following these series and hopefully they might be of value to you or someone you know.